I'm Sandra D. Robinson, and welcome to The Divorce Project. Are you or someone you know going through a divorce or a custody battle? Well, this show offers legal guidance and caring solutions to help you create a healthy family dynamic as you're going through divorce and post-divorce. Soon, you'll meet the host of The Divorce Project, family law attorney, Barry Fisher. Each show, Barry chooses family specialists, and he takes parents and children, and they talk about divorce. They focus on the positive outcomes and the wonderful mindsets that can happen when we all work together. Thank you for joining us on The Divorce Project. My name is Barry Fisher. I'm a family law attorney that's been practicing in Beverly Hills for 26 years. From the inception of this show, we wanted to bring guests on, judges, lawyers, accountants, psychologists, parents, and children that can talk about divorce, going through a divorce, before a divorce, and after a divorce. And the purpose of this show is to try to help the audience understand the process of divorce and how to go through it in a conscious way. Well, today we have a very special guest, Fred Warzowski, from the accounting firm of White, Zuckerman, and Warzowski. He's been in the business for over 30 years. He's testified over a thousand times. He's a true expert in forensic accounting. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you very much, Barry. And, you know, we're going to start off with talking about what does a forensic accountant do? Well, generally, we are retained by either one of the parties sometimes both of the parties, sometimes the, the both attorneys will call us and decide to attend us jointly, and sometimes we're appointed by the court to represent the court. And the goal of the forensic accountant is to try and resolve the monetary issues as a function of what the scope of the engagement is. It could be support, it could be the division of the community property estate, it could be tracing assets to their character as belonging to one of the parties or the community, or it could be determination of a value of a business. It could be determination of how much of, let's say, a residence or a rental property is community versus one party's separate property. Mm -hmm. So in essence, we create what amounts to is a, we call a community property balance sheet that lists out all the assets and all the liabilities of the parties and then determines what a reasonable division would be. You know, it's very interesting for the attorney to work with a good forensic accountant because a good forensic accountant helps the attorney figure out what does the attorney have to get from the other side to prove his case. For instance, forensic accountants provide lists of documents that are needed during the process. So if you have a case that involves assets and business valuation and support, if you think the spouse is hiding money, if you're trying to value a professional business, my recommendation is to hire a forensic accountant very early in the case. And I think it's important for the attorney and the forensic accountant to be comfortable with each other and have a good working relationship. Um, what happens when there are forensics on both sides? Or generally speaking, it's a function of how the attorneys handle the case. Um, my experience is to make things uh, run as smoothly as possible is for the attorneys to allow the experts to confer, to exchange documents. Like typically we get involved in a case, we'll prepare document inventories of all the documents we have. We do it electronically, and most of the firms we work against do the same thing. So. The first goal then would be to exchange documents to make sure everything's transparent. Again, to save fees and costs, assuming that the attorneys are going to be cooperative. And that's always been my recommendation. You know, it's a very interesting thing because divorce and family law is an adversarial court system. And the two attorneys go into court with different points of view. But one of the bridges in family law is the forensic accountant because if the forensic accountants meet and confer, they can solve the disputes and save the people hundreds of thousands of dollars in litigation costs by coming up with some commonality as to what the value of the business is or even defining what their different points of view are. 
So that one forensic accountant may say it's worth a million, the other one say a million and a half, and they're saying why they valued it differently, and then the court can hear from both sides on that focused issue and decide the value. So it's very efficient to use forensics. Um, if I may interject, uh, as a matter of fact, more and more of the judges uh, who I deal with, either retired judges or retired to represent, in fact, in fact like a de facto judge, just to save the efforts of being trial downtown, and even the judges downtown, more and more insisting that the forensics meet and confer. They want to minimize the issues before trial, so they'll instruct both attorneys to tell the experts to meet, confer, and prepare side-by-side -side balance sheets, side-by-side -side valuation reports. Why are you different? And have the accountants meet, and between the two of them, spell out the differences, assuming they can't come to a concurrence of opinion. And you know, sometimes one spouse has all the money, control of the money, and the other spouse doesn't have any money, but they need to both hire different forensics. And the court allows the person that doesn't have money, the spouse that doesn't have money, to take a lien on the house and allow to pay the forensic accountant from that lien. Do you have cases like that where that occurs? That happens on occasion. Sometimes, for example, if the attorneys are going to be acting in a reasonable fashion, and most of them have the tendency to do so, there'll just be a request from one attorney to another that uh, I've hired my expert and I want to have a retainer for my expert to start working on the case. And sometimes if this lack of cooperation, what the attorneys will do, they'll ask us to prepare declarations, which detail out what the scope of our engagement is, let's say like to evaluate a business, to determine uh, the character of a house or asset that was purchased, and we spell out what we have to do, and what it will take to do it, and an estimate of the fees to do it. So we prepare a declaration for fees and costs, and that goes before the court, and the court decides how much they would award. And, you know, let's talk about a subject that I think the audience would be very interested in, which is the family residence. And oftentimes, people, like one spouse, owns the family residence before marriage, and then gets married. And then during the marriage, the community, or the earnings that come into both parties, is used to pay the mortgage. So what, what can you tell us about who owns the house, how do they divide it, how do they value it? Well, the valuation of the house would uh, most likely be done by a expert who specializes in real estate, who will come in and determine the value of the house. Okay. Now, sometimes they may require the expert to value the house on a few occasions, because the, if the house is going to be, let's say, theoretically, just in the original party's name, and uh, uh, I would call a vanilla case, a simple case where, in essence, there are no refinances, title never changes, there are no major improvements, then the community gets to share in the appreciation of the house as a function of how much of the debt reduction occurred during marriage. I'm not going to go into equations because that's beyond the... Let me try to make it a little more simple for the audience, I okay? It was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have, let's say the husband owns the house before marriage and they'll have to value the house as of the date of marriage. And then they'll value the house as of the date of trial uh, to, to find how much did the house go up in value. Then they're going to figure out percentage-wise how much did the husband own before the date of marriage and how much did the community own percentage-wise. And they do that by figuring out how much the community, and by the way, when I say community, that's the earnings that comes in after marriage and before data separation. How much of those funds were used to pay down the debt and create more equity? And from that increase in equity, it's a pro rata share with how much the husband owned before. And that's what the forensic the, figures out for us. In essence, the house is separate property, but the community may have a component interest and what Barry is describing is, in essence, the way the math works simply is that you take the debt reduction and you divide that by the original purchase price of the house. That then is multiplied by the difference of the fair market value from the date of marriage to the date of trial. That number then gives the community a share in the 
increased uh, appreciation. To that, you add uh, to the community the portion of the debt reduction, and that is basically is based on case law, and that's relatively a straightforward issue. With one important fact is that the earnings you have during marriage are community, but that does not include, for example, earnings, let's say, from real estate or uh, passive investments. We're talking about your active participation from a job. But if you have money coming in from a trust account or a separate bank account, and that's the account that services the debt, then it is still deemed to be a separate property. Well, you're, you're describing now um, that if you own separate property before and you keep it separate, from the community, you don't commingle it, it remains separate. Right. And if you pay for it from separate funds, like any payments that are due on it, it still stays separate. If you can trace it to a separate property source. Right. And then if you use an independent management company to manage that separate property, it's still separate. Even though you, if you put your labor into it, then community starts to have a claim. They could. Right. Okay. Now. Many people are married to professionals, lawyers, doctors, accountants, and the issue comes up is how do you value the professional practice? Uh, let's say the, um, before marriage, the professional was in business for 10 years, and now he's been married 20 years, and now he's getting divorced. So there was a value to the business before marriage, and as of the date of marriage, and there's an increase in the business during marriage, and then there's an end value. So the forensic accountant would help the attorney and the parties figure out the value of the professional business. Is that correct? Well, they would value the business and also determine the community property interest in the business. If the business started out in the hands of one of the parties uh, prior to marriage, it's still a separate property business. But any increase in value could have a community property component based on looking at the values at the different dates and uh, applying like a reasonable rate of return under one theory and under another theory is that if the community was reasonably compensated throughout the marriage then there could be no community property interest as a function of the kind of business you're talking about but in a professional business like a doctor or a CPA or uh, a attorney that would most likely be a situation where you would look at the appreciation during marriage to see how much it increased and do an allocation between community and separate. And uh, sometimes the, uh, the professional business um, loses money does the, during the marriage. Does the community have any value in it then? Any interest in it? If it loses money, then the answer is no. Because if there is no appreciation during marriage, then there would be no community property interest. Basically, you look at the values of the other marriage and apply a reasonable rate of return as if you put it into an investment that was a safe investment. So you take the return plus the original value. So let's say theoretically you start out with a value of $1 million and over a period of time a reasonable return would have made it $1.8 million in total and if the value would have to be then in excess of $1.8 million as of the date of trial to have any community property interest. If it falls short of that then still considered to be separate property. Okay. Also, you mentioned um, if the uh, married couple is receiving adequate compensation from the business during the marriage, in other words, are they drawing money from the business and are they spending it on themselves and their family, then they wouldn't be entitled to then claim a community interest if that was an adequate amount of money that they were being paid during the marriage based on the increase in value of the business. Is that correct? Well, that's only true if you have pretty much a non-service business. I'm not going to go into the case law without my position as I'm not an attorney. But in essence, it's what drove the value of the increase in the business. Let's say, for example, if you happen to own a McDonald franchise prior to the date of marriage. No one knows who owns the McDonald franchise or you own, let's say, like a liquor store. Uh, then it's really the value of the entity that increases or decreases on its own. It's not your effort, and your effort doing marriage is community, but you happen to be professional, then that situation of being reasonably compensated I don't think is really relevant because it goes more just to the value of the businesses. And there's cases that basically say if you can apply one 
basis, which is the change in value. That's basically due to the fact that the working spouse, his or her efforts was the primary cause of the increase in value. Now, if you go to the other case where it's compensation, then it's more and more driven by the asset itself or market conditions. One of the other uh, important functions that I always use forensic accountants for is determining cash available for support. I mean, what is the other spouse really making? And um, could you tell us a little bit some of the things that would be included in the calculation for income for support from a spouse that's running their own business? Well, you'd be looking at, let's say it's a C corporation, you'd be looking at the salary that they're drawing, you'd be looking at uh, also go going through the books and records and trying to determine any now personal expenses being written through the business, like for auto, travel, entertainment, or rent, it could be virtually anything. Uh, and there's also the issue of undistributed profits. There could be a great deal of profits, especially for a personal service business, like a medical practice or a dental practice or a CPA practice, where there's no need to retain uh, working capital and that could be considered available for support. Then there's also the issue of unreported income, which is probably the most time-consuming and difficult part for any expert to quantify. So for a forensic accountant to determine all that, the lawyer obtains the documents from the other side, which include the bank statements, the credit card statements, the um, uh, cancel checks, uh, and for the corporate account, the business account, and for the personal account, and then looks at all that and then comes up with a report. Generally speaking, yes. But sometimes, for example, if the issue is like unreported income, then we have to find some way to try and quantify it. What we do then is we'll sit down with the outspouse and use what the IRS used to call the Capone method. It really was called the Capone method because they couldn't find uh, Al Capone guilty of anything except for tax fraud. So what they did was they reconstructed his lifestyle and determined it was like three, four million dollars a year. They looked at about how much money he was reporting as his income. Then they look at what assets did he sell, if any, what liabilities did he accumulate. And if those things don't bounce, then theoretically the rest has to come from unreported income. So we'll do an analysis, for example, in that direction. Or try and find invoices. Sometimes they throw away uh, documentation such as invoices from restaurants and you look at certain ratios mm -hmm. so you try to quantify what the unreported income is. That is usually though a difficult and time-consuming procedure. One of the other things that we're allowed to do in family law cases is establish what's called the marital standard of living. So when two spouses separate, the spouse that leaves is entitled to get the level of living that they were living during the marriage, which is called the marital standard of living. And forensic accountants will also play a role in creating that report. So could you describe for us what that report includes? Well, that report would actually go in two possible directions. Uh, one direction is to look at all the credit card expenses, uh, all of the bank statements, uh, look through the corporation for personal expenses, being written through the company, let's say, because that is really part of the lifestyle. If you're paying for vacations and, and travel and cars and such, and you try and do an accumulation of all the expenses over a period of, let's say, two years prior to separation to get an idea of how the parties spent their money. Then uh, another way that people look at nowadays is they go to an income approach. To look at the income that the parties have, which is pretty much of the cash flow, but prior to separation, after taxes, and then they determine what the allocation should be between the two parties. Because when people go through the expense method, which is all the credit cards and all the bank statements and such, people could be living well beyond their means. Now, if that's the case, there's cases on point that say that if you live beyond your means, then the marriage standard of living loses its relevance. But if you go to an income approach, then basically it's a measurement of what the income could be used to live without going above or below your lifestyle mm -hmm. or your needs. At, at what point in the case would you recommend to the public to hire a forensic accountant? I'd say right at the beginning. And the reason why it will save a fortune, in my opinion, in discovery. In other words, uh, a lot of attorneys I work with, including you, what they'll do is we'll have a very thorough interview with the client and discuss all the issues. In other words, I had a case a while ago where 
the doctor said, said, oh, by the way, this is my second wife, and I got divorced from my first wife 10 years ago. So I had this medical practice prior to getting married to this wife. So I said, well, that will save a lot of fees. So I quickly looked at his financial statements from his practice at the date of his second marriage and compared it to the current financials and discovered there was little or no growth. So we basically contacted the other side and said, we'll be glad to give you the information, but one of the issues that should come off the table is the money to be spent on doing the valuation. So, and with respect to discovery, to make sure that the right documents are asked for, sometimes we're retained by less experienced attorneys. They'll call us, actually, even after discovery's been cut off. So we have our hands tied. Right, right. You know, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I want to briefly touch on tracing. So if, some, if one of the spouses owns property and money before the marriage and commingles it with the community account and then uses it to buy something, can that spouse still claim that it's his or her separate property? If they do a proper tracing, they can claim that part of it is uh, separate property, and or maybe all of it. And briefly tell us what a tracing is. What a tracing is, is, is in essence, if we get the bank records and the documents necessary to, in essence, take, a, let's say, like a B of A account and break it into two component parts, a community portion and a separate portion, and if we follow the case law properly, we can see how much money was available at the time that an asset was acquired to see whether or not community funds were exhausted. Because conceptually, the community is given the first opportunity to acquire assets during marriage. So if theoretically we can show on our tracing that community was exhausted or the community balance of that account was zero as of the date of acquisition, mm -hmm. then we are in a position to state that the only separate property could have acquired, let's say, that condominium. And your tracing would include uh, following the money from where it originated, maybe from the sale of a prior house before marriage, into a bank account, into stocks and bonds, back into a bank account, and all the way into the newly acquired asset during marriage. Yes, sometimes we've had to do this for 20 years through literally hundreds of bank accounts. Now, through time, we develop our own proprietary programs that allow us to do this by linking all the bank accounts, because otherwise it's an impossible task to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I want to thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, you're a great forensic accountant. I love working with you, and you know we always have a good time with the cases, and we always get a good result. So it's a great combination. Your firm is amazing, White, uh, Zuckerman, and Warzowski. I hope that you'll come back to our show and speak about other subjects, because there's many, many, many subjects that we could speak about. Well, I really enjoyed that. It was a pleasure talking. Thank you. Show. And I want to thank uh, Romeo Carey, the director of KBEV. And what's amazing about this show is that this show is fully produced by Beverly Hills High School students. And they do a great job. And we want to thank KBEV for allowing us to produce the show here. And we want to invite you back next week. Please come. We'll have another interesting show with some other interesting guests. And we'll talk about subjects that will help you go through divorce in a conscious way. Thank you. We thank you for tuning in, and we invite you, our viewing audience, to participate in next week's conversation. On The Divorce Project, our goal is to help bring you the healthy outcome that your family deserves. So please email your questions to team at thedivorceproject.com or call us directly at the number on your screen.